o'clock convocation to try to answer the question of how we got to where we are at the present moment in Vietnam and indicated that uh, tonight I would devote most of my time to a discussion of the question of where do we go uh, from here. But before I get into that second question, I would like to just very quickly uh, hit the uh, highlights of what I said uh, earlier today as a means of uh, backgrounding my own position uh, with reference to the Vietnam issue and also so that we can proceed uh, with a little better understanding of what some of the questions are that now uh, face us from here on out uh, in Southeast Asia. Let me say, uh, uh, first of all, that the role of a uh, moderate and restrained uh, but nevertheless concerned uh, critic of our Vietnam policy, which is the role I have tried to play, uh, is not a very easy role for a United States senator to carry out, and particularly for a senator who belongs to the same political party as the president and who is an admirer and strong supporter of President Johnson. Furthermore, those who take uh, issue with certain aspects of foreign policy always run the risk of being accused of undermining our own country and giving some degree of aid and comfort to the enemy. And yet I think on balance, the role of the critics with reference to the Vietnam struggle has been a useful and constructive role. Those uh, people who argue on conscientious grounds that public dissent uh, encourages the enemy, I can only say that we cannot afford to surrender one of our most precious privileges in this country, which is the privilege of open discussion and dissent, merely because there is in the world a uh, hostile power that has never known the conditions of freedom and therefore might misunderstand its free expression uh, in our own society. In other words, I think it would be ironical indeed if we were to fight so hard for freedom in Vietnam that we lost it here at home. There is no battle in Vietnam. There is no interest, no American interest in Vietnam that is so essential that it justifies giving up the right of honest discussion and conscientious dissent here on the home front. Furthermore, the uh, critics of our policy in Vietnam have been vindicated by a generally sensitive and constructive response on the part of the administration. Now, I think it's entirely understandable that the administration has drawn a line between constructive and thoughtful critics on one hand and sensation-seeking exhibitionists on the other. I can't believe that any administration can countenance the burning of draft cards and the interference with troop movements and with other uh, irresponsible and sensational antics of that kind. I don't know whether those uh, exhibitions have given aid and uh, comfort to the enemy, as some have said, but I do know that they have caused a considerable amount of dismay among those of us who have been seeking all along to exert an effective and a practical influence on the administration designed to encourage that administration, that administration to step up its efforts for a negotiated settlement. And while I continue to hold deep misgivings about the foreign policy assumptions that have involved uh, major American military forces in Southeast Asia. I think it must be said in all fairness that much of what the critics has recommended since the beginning of this year has been thoughtfully evaluated and in fact has been adopted at least partially as subsequent administration policy. Now, early this year, going back to the middle of January, when Senator Church of Idaho and I took the floor of the Senate one afternoon to urge the administration to make a public offer to negotiate the war in Vietnam without attaching preconditions, but simply to state that this country stood ready at any time 
to go to the conference table and try to negotiate an honorable settlement of that conflict. That recommendation was regarded as unrealistic. We were told that there was nothing to negotiate. We were told that there could be no suggestion of negotiations until the military situation was stabilized and began to turn in our favor. We argued in response that America was walking on one leg in Vietnam, the military leg, while neglecting the political, the diplomatic, and the economic aspects of that struggle. The answer to that was that any talk of negotiations would only undermine the resolve of our military forces and would give encouragement to the enemy. And yet after a few weeks of that kind of prodding, and thoughtful criticism, and insistent urging, President Johnson announced at Johns Hopkins University on April 7th that from that day on, our policy would be based in part on our willingness to negotiate without preconditions at any time the other side was willing to sit down at the conference table. Negotiation was a dirty word in January and February and March, but since April 7th, it has become the adopted policy and the adopted goal of the administration. <clears throat> Likewise, the administration, in due course, responded to the suggestion of the critics that we ought to broaden our interest in Southeast Asia and that we ought to look beyond the day when men would be locked in a military struggle in that part of the world to deal with the real war that needs to be fought in Southeast Asia, and that's the war against hunger and poverty and illiteracy. And so that offer was made, that we were willing, once the fighting stopped, to offer aid to the extent of a billion dollars to North as well as South Vietnam, designed to build up the economy and the society of Southeast Asia. Even the repeated insistence of the critics that we quit bypassing and ignoring the United Nations has borne fruit. So it is quite clear that the administration in recent weeks has made a serious effort to inform the Secretary General of our policies and to seek his help and the good offices of other UN officials in reaching a settlement. So I think the critics at least have the uh, consolation tonight of seeing some changes in a more hopeful and constructive direction. I regret that the lack of widespread congressional debate, which seems to have characterized this struggle from the beginning, and the meagerness of, of searching uh, public discussion has resulted, nevertheless, in a virtual surrender of congressional responsibility in the Vietnam struggle. And as a partial consequence, the role of the United States in Vietnam has changed drastically from the role of a limited advisory and economic aid function to that of a major U.S. military responsibility in which we find ourselves tonight carrying the major responsibility for the offensive war in South Vietnam. All of this has been accomplished since 1954 without sustained congressional debate and review and evaluation, to say nothing of a declaration of war. So let us see uh, just very quickly how the role of the United States has changed in this conflict in the past 10 years. And I think we can see that by taking three or four brief statements, beginning with President Eisenhower's original commitment of October 1954, 11 years ago almost uh, this very night. In his original statement to the Premier of South Vietnam, President Eisenhower said in his letter in committing American uh, support to that regime, the purpose of this offer <clears throat> is to assist the government of Vietnam in developing and maintaining a strong, viable state capable of resisting attempted subversion or aggression through military means. The government of the United States expects that this aid will be met by performance on the part of the government of Vietnam in undertaking needed reforms. End of quote. There is no hint here of anything other than economic assistance. 
and even that was made conditional on the carrying out of reforms by the government of Mr. Ziem in Saigon. On September 2nd, 1963, we have the clearest statement of the late President Kennedy's view as to our role in Vietnam, statement which he delivered at a press conference just shortly before he was killed. And I quote again, I don't think that unless a greater effort is made by the government, meaning the government in Saigon, to win popular support that the war can be won out there. In the final analysis, it is their war. They are the ones who have to win or lose it. We can help them. We can give them equipment. We can send some men out there as advisors, but they have to win it. The people of Vietnam against the communists. We are prepared to continue to assist them, but I don't think that the war can be won unless the people support the effort. End of quote. On August 12 of last year, President Johnson said, the South Vietnamese have the basic responsibility for the defense of their own freedom. And in testifying before congressional committees at about that same time, and explaining the function of U.S. Uh, military personnel in Vietnam, Secretary of Defense McNamara had this to say, and this is the final quote. I think we must recognize that success in the counterinsurgency campaign in South Vietnam depends upon the South, Vietnam, the South Vietnamese themselves. It depends upon their ability to construct a stable government. It depends upon their willingness to fight. It depends upon the competency with which they are led. It depends upon the extent to which their government deserves and receives the loyalty of the people and the support of the people. All of these conditions, said Mr. McNamara, are conditions that additional men and equipment from the United States are not likely to advance. End of quote. Now, these statements make it perfectly clear that we did not go into Southeast Asia to fight a war with American forces. We are now following a course which is sharply at variance with the advisory and the supporting role previously spelled out by three presidents and enunciated as recently as last year by the Secretary of Defense. Now, I personally wish that we had never become involved militarily in, in Vietnam. I wish we had given no encouragement to the French during their unsuccessful effort uh, to reestablish their colonial empire in that part of the world after World War II, an unsuccessful effort uh, that ended in the debacle at Dien Bien Phu in 1954. French colonialism in that part of the world should have been allowed to experience a quiet funeral uh, with no assistance from the United States. I wish we had not then fallen into the gradually growing military involvement that has led us to our present uh, military position in that part of the globe. I wish instead that we had used our influence to maintain the Geneva Settlement of 1954, including the holding of elections in 1956 as provided by that agreement to determine the future course of both North and South Vietnam. President Eisenhower said in his memoirs, which doubtless some of you have read, that Ho Chi Minh would have won such an election with a margin of approximately 80% of the vote in both North Vietnam and South Vietnam. But that does not mean, even if Mr. Eisenhower were correct in his assessment, that the resulting leader of Vietnam would have been a vassal of China any more than Tito is a vassal of Moscow. Indeed, the Vietnamese North and South have historically resisted Chinese influence and power in that part of the world. But nevertheless, I fully recognize that we can't turn back the clock. We can't go back to 1945 or 1954 or even 1964. 
We have 150,000 men committed to the fighting in Vietnam. We have a substantial portion of our air power and naval power engaged in that uh, theater of operations. And what has been done to now uh, cannot be undone. So where then do we go from this point on? I think there are three possible alternatives ahead of us. Number one, we could continue to accelerate the struggle uh, toward a major war in an all-out uh, military effort to smash uh, communist power in Southeast Asia. Number two, we could call off the whole war and simply withdraw our forces. Or number three, we could consolidate our present position, keep our casualties at a bare minimum, and hold out indefinitely for a negotiated settlement with our best efforts and our best brains and our best talents directed at finding a breakthrough on the diplomatic front designed to bring this struggle from the battlefield into the conference room. I recommend the third course. I urge that we stop the bombing attacks both in the north and in the south immediately, and I mean for more than five days. I mean an indefinite suspension of bombing designed to create a climate where negotiations might be possible. I don't accept the view that the way to bring Hanoi to the conference table is to bomb targets in North and South Vietnam. I think that increases the rigidity and the stubbornness of the other side and makes it less likely that a climate of negotiations can be built. And furthermore, bombing is a largely ineffective device in a guerrilla war where you more often kill the wrong people, and by that I mean the innocent non-combatants, the men and women and children who are not necessarily Viet Cong guerrillas merely because they happen to reside in a village where a handful of Viet Cong infiltrators has moved in. We should also stop, insofar as we can, the offensive jungle land skirmishes, which subject uh, our soldiers to ambush and which conducts the war according to the ground rules that best favors the other side and places us in the greatest peril. Instead, I would hope that we would consolidate our troops in a holding action in the cities and along well-defended uh, coastal enclaves. We can hold on to those areas with a minimum of casualties. I fully recognize that there are some risks involved, uh, both military and political, no matter what course we follow. There isn't any ideal uh, solution to this struggle any longer. But at least this is a course which will hold to a minimum the casualties on both sides and would recognize the military and political realities that face us in Vietnam today. Such a plan would have the advantage of providing a haven for anti-communist and pro-government forces, including the religious groups in South Vietnam that would most likely fall victim to Viet Cong tactics. It would demonstrate that we are continuing our commitment to the government in Saigon. It is the best device, as I see it, for saving both lives and political face, which are the two most sensitive factors to be considered at this point. Furthermore, it is based on the present realities of the map that now confronts us in South Vietnam. While we are in control of most of the cities and the coastal areas, the guerrillas control most of the rural and village areas. We could probably dislodge those guerrillas with enough intensive and massive pounding from the air, but to dislodge them in that fashion would be to destroy in the process thousands of innocent civilians that we are supposedly there to save. I've often wondered if the forgotten people in this war aren't the Vietnamese people themselves. I wonder what their thinking is as they look at this uh, tragic meat grinder in which they seem to have been caught as the armies from both sides move back and forth across the country. A recent news report that appeared, I think, in all of our newspapers described the despair 
of American officers, of American Marines, who arrived in the village of Bagia, which our forces had just recaptured from the Viet Cong, after three or four days of relentless U.S. bombing and machine gun and rocket attacks supported by armored uh, helicopters. What the officers found when they moved into that supposed Viet Cong village were weeping women uh, holding their dead children or nursing their wounds and their burns. The village church and the school had been destroyed. Most of the houses had been burned and blasted and the people who had been considered pro-government were filled with bitterness toward their rescuers, their liberators. Meanwhile, the handful of Viet Cong guerrillas who had been responsible for our bombardment in the first place had melted away into the jungle and were never found. Surveying the, the tragedy in that village, as reported by the Associated Press reporter who was on that mission, one American officer remarked, this is why we're losing this stupid war. It's senseless, just plain senseless. A policy of restricting our military efforts in Vietnam to a holding action in the cities and the coastal enclaves will avoid that kind of self-defeating uh, jungle warfare. And let me say at this point that I know that war uh, never is just. I know that the innocent are often hurt along with the guilty, and there's no really neat and clean way uh, to conduct a war. But one of the great differences between bombing villages in South Vietnam in order to get at the enemy and bombing villages in Nazi Germany 20 years ago is that then we were attacking an enemy country bent on world conquest, whereas today, in attacking the villages in South Vietnam, we're attacking our ally. We're attacking the country that we're supposedly trying to rescue, that we're supposedly trying to stabilize. And I quite agree with the New York Times reporter who said in an article in New York Times Magazine a week ago Sunday that sometimes the conduct of the war would seem to make more sense in South Vietnam if we were fighting an enemy country instead of liberating a friend. We can supply, and we can feed, and we can defend the urban and coastal areas in South Vietnam with a modest effort and a minimum loss of life. This is a strategy that actually calls primarily for patience. It calls for restraint until such time as the Viet Cong is willing to go to the conference table to negotiate a settlement. Now, I've been critical of our unilateral involvement in Vietnam. I'm critical of the original commitment. I think having made that commitment, if we were to go in at all, we should have gone in under international and hopefully UN auspices. But nevertheless, we made the commitment. Our forces are there. Their lives are on the line. And I would be prepared to support the kind of limited action that I've described above for as many years as is necessary to reach an honorable and practical settlement of this struggle. Now, such a policy involving political patience and military restraint requires that we put the issue of Vietnam in a more reasonable uh, perspective. We must stop uh, talking about this conflict as though the honor of America and our stature in the world depends almost entirely on what happens in South Vietnam. I think our top officials ought to quit contending that the fate of the human race and the cause of mankind is going to be decided by what goes on in Saigon. In the first place, it isn't true. American military power in the Pacific is largely in the firepower and in the maneuverability of our 7th Fleet plus our island uh, air bases. And that enormous firepower, which is the mightiest military force in the Pacific, will remain no matter what goes on in Vietnam. Nobody really believes that the United States of America is a paper tiger in Asia or anywhere else. Secondly, exaggerated talk and front page news reports of 
bombing missions and B-52 raids and daily uh, jungle forays focus excessive uh, public attention on the Vietnamese issue both at home and abroad. I think it diverts attention from much more fundamental issues that are going to affect the future well-being and strength of this country far more than what happens in Southeast Asia. Such matters as the relationship of the United States to the Soviet Union, the strength of the Atlantic community, the strength of the Alliance for Progress, the control of nuclear weapons, and other steps that promise a greater degree of security and a better life for the people of the planet. The Korean War, uh, rightfully or not, destroyed the confidence of millions of Americans in the peacekeeping capacity of the Truman administration. I think much of that criticism was unfair and badly directed, but nevertheless, the fact remains that General Eisenhower capitalized on that anxiety and wrecked the presidential bid of Governor Stevenson in considerable part by pledging to go to Korea and negotiate a settlement. So those politicians who, in the name of helping the president, are urging him on to a larger and larger military effort in Southeast Asia, while they may be speaking with sincere motives, it is not without passing interest that President Johnson rolled up a landslide victory last fall in considerable part because the overwhelming majority of Americans favored the policy of restraint, which he advocated and rejected the recommendations of his opponent that we participate in the bombing of North Vietnam and the commitment of much larger American forces to that part of the world. Stopping the bombing raids and the daily battles in the jungle quietly consolidating and holding the enclaves along the coast and in the cities, and reducing the number of exaggerated statements about the importance of Vietnam to the survival of the human race. These steps will do much to place that issue in better perspective and open the way for an honorable settlement. I think the beneficial results of such a policy of moderation and restraint combined with patience and firmness are these. First of all, it will demonstrate to friend and foe alike that we have the staying power uh, to keep our commitments without needless fanfare and loss of blood. Secondly, it will enable us to conduct our commitment according to the guidelines that are most practical for us rather than playing the game according to guerrilla rule, which include the jungle ambush and the pulling of American firepower against villages that might otherwise be friendly to the government in Saigon. Thirdly, it will take the Russians out of a dilemma that is pressing them back into a more uh, belligerent stance with the Chinese. Fourth, it will ease the pressure on such friendly allies as the Wilson government in Britain, which is under great political pressure at home because of its identification with our effort in Vietnam. Fifth, it will remove much of the diplomatic and political hazard for this administration, both at home and abroad. And that's something that, as a member of the President's party, I have an interest in. Sixth, it will reduce the necessity of calling up our reserves and stepping up the draft while saving countless millions of dollars that can be used to improve our society and our economy. Seventh, it will reduce the danger of World War III and improve the chances for further steps towards peace. And most significant of all, it is the practical way of saving a political face while at the same time holding to a minimum the loss of human life, the lives of our soldiers, and the lives of the Vietnamese people. So while properly deploying our arms, in Southeast Asia, I hope that we will recall what I regard as the wise words of uh, John Kennedy in that great inaugural address when he said, let us begin anew, remembering on both sides that civility is not a sign of weakness and sincerity is always subject to proof. Let us never negotiate out of fear 
but let us never fear to negotiate. And then in what I personally regard as his greatest speech, the American University Address of June 10, 1963, Mr. Kennedy said, we shall do our part to build a world of peace where the weak are safe and the strong are just. We are not helpless before that task or hopeless of its success. And I think we share the resolve of the late president when he said, confident and unafraid, we labor on, not toward a strategy of annihilation, but toward a strategy of peace. Thank you very much. Any questions from the floor? Uh, one minute. <laughs> yes, we will. Questions on the floor, please? Yes? If I may synthesize that question for the tape recording, uh, isn't the holding operation suggested by uh, Senator McGovern the same tactic that the French tried to use uh, unsuccessfully in their war with the Viet Minh? Well, I think there are a good many differences between the French situation and our, our own. Uh, one of the uh, principal uh, differences is that we have the, the naval and air power to sustain uh, our positions along the, uh, along the coast uh, and in the cities. I think the uh, similarities, however, uh, between what the French were doing leading up to the end then few and what we're doing now are far closer than what I've recommended here in consolidating our position in, in well-defended positions. Uh, the end then few uh, was, a, was a military uh, disaster from every standpoint because of the way it was laid out, the way it was planned. But I think it's quite practical for us to think in terms of sustaining a position that we can supply and defend from the coast where we have enormous uh, naval power and where we have uh, control of the supply routes, control of the air. I think that kind of a uh, defensive action uh, is far more effective than trying to carry the war uh, into the jungle, uh, either with uh, artillery or with air power, where more often than not, you kill the innocent rather than the guilty. Uh, the gentleman in the blue shirt. I don't think the key factor in this war at any time has been the <clears throat> influx of people from North Vietnam. I think the uh, fact that the Viet Cong guerrillas have achieved their greatest strength in the South uh, a thousand miles away from the uh, 17th uh, parallel, where they've had to live largely off the countryside, live largely off uh, captured arms, that they got from troops which were equipped by us, live largely off the food supply that they were able to scavenge in the countryside, is an indication that the basic ingredient in their effort is not the aid that they're getting from North Vietnam, but the fact that there's been very little resistance to their effort uh, in the countryside. So that our efforts to seal off the uh, uh, border uh, at the uh, 17th parallel, in my judgment, uh, have not been a very effective and haven't had very much uh, impact on the uh, conduct of the war. I think you have a better chance of bringing the other side to the negotiating table when their uh, country is not being bombed, when their area is not under attack uh, from the air, uh, than you do as matters now stand. It's inconceivable to me that any proud 
uh, government, as we know Ho Chi Minh's government is, uh, would come to the conference table when they're under uh, aerial bombardment, the kind that we've been carrying on. I think it, we create a much better climate for negotiation uh, if we'll stop the bombing attacks and concentrate get greater effort on trying to find a diplomatic breakthrough. That was the recommendation that uh, Senator Fulbright made on the Meet the Press program on Sunday. I didn't get the idea from him because I've been advocating this for a long time, but I think it's a sound position. Gentleman, the sweater. I think uh, we, we repeat the question for the uh, radio. Do you believe that the North Vietnamese government would come to the conference table independent of the red, of red Chinese participation? I think that's our, our greatest problem. I think that uh, Peking uh, has found it's in, in, its, in its interest to discourage uh, Hanoi from entering into negotiations because uh, no matter how much we may uh, believe that we're checking uh, Chinese power by carrying on a war in Vietnam, I suspect that we may be advancing their interest by committing as many of our forces and as much of our uh, resources to that war as we have while they sit on the sidelines uh, without the commitment of a single Chinese soldier and with very little uh, commitment of resources on their part. Uh, even Secretary Rusk has said that it now seems clear that the Red Chinese are willing to fight until the last Vietnamese is dead. And I think that's been their position of aiding and abetting and encouraging the continuing of this conflict because they think that as long as the war continues, it serves their interest. It may very well be that the one factor that has pressured uh, North Vietnam into a closer relationship in China has been the military pressure that we've exerted uh, in the South, and the pressure that we've kept up uh, both uh, on the ground and in the air uh, against uh, the Vietnamese forces. I think if some of that pressure can be relaxed, we may find that Hanoi is in a more uh, favorable mood to negotiate than they are when they're under attack and being forced to listen more and more to the Chinese as a source of aid. Gentlemen here. Of the escalation of the war. Basic causes of the escalation of the war. Well, the basic uh, causes, as I see it, is that the, uh, re the regimes that have been in power uh, in South uh, Vietnam have not been able to sustain a military position against the guerrillas without uh, constant increases of American aid. We began this current year with somewhere around 20,000 Americans uh, in Vietnam, most of them playing advisory roles. We know that uh, today, 10 months later, there are somewhere around 135 or 40,000 American forces in Vietnam. And that uh, was done largely because of the uh, judgment of our military and our uh, political uh, people in Saigon uh, in conjunction with their uh, counterparts in Washington, that this was the only way uh, to stabilize the military front against the Viet Cong guerrillas. I think there's a more fundamental factor that the uh, governments that have been in power in Saigon have just not been able to win popular uh, political support across the country. And they've had to try to compensate for that by increasing amounts of American military power from the outside. There's no question in my mind but that the amount of aid that we have sent in on our side uh, dwarfs uh, the amount of aid that the uh, Russians and the Chinese have sent in from the North. Sir? Well, I'd, I'd like to ask the Senator, on the basis of what you said this afternoon, sir, and then what has been said tonight regarding these governments in South Vietnam, is there any reason to hope that this government of General Chi uh, the present government there is uh, any more disposed toward reforms than the governments that have uh, gone in rapid succession in the past 10 years. Is there any reason to hope that the present government in Saigon under General Key is any more disposed towards reform <coughs> than, I suppose, back to Bao Dai? 
I don't think General Key is a reformer. Uh, he, uh, he has, he's the man who, who has said publicly that his hero is Adolf Hitler. And uh, he, he's not interested in the kind of peaceful, constitutional, democratic reform that we think of when we, we talk about uh, reforming a country and building a strong uh, democratic base. And one of the reasons why the American people have not properly understood the issue in Vietnam is that it has been painted for us as a struggle of freedom against tyranny when it's nothing of the kind. It's a struggle between a military dictatorship in South Vietnam against a military dictatorship that has been aided and abetted uh, from the north. There's no real issue of democracy at stake here in this uh, struggle, and the notion that General Key is some kind of a, of a Western-style uh, diplomat is nonsense. But it may well be that we have had a, a significant new change in American policy in South Vietnam with the sending of General Lansdale and his team uh, to South Vietnam a few months ago with instructions to go ahead and carry out reforms whether the Vietnamese want them or not. And the, the strategy under which the Lansdale program is going forward is one first of clearing an area militarily of the Viet Cong and then moving in with American administrators and American advisors to, in effect, superimpose uh, reforms uh, in the land and the tax structure and health and education and housing and health right down the line uh, on the uh, pattern that our aid mission thinks is necessary to bring some degree of stability. Now, what MacArthur did in Japan? Somewhat, somewhat perhaps on the order of, uh, of General MacArthur's uh, program uh, in Japan. That seems to be the same uh, uh, theory and the same uh, strategy. Now, whether you can do that in a society as, as primitive and as uh, backward as uh, Vietnam's uh, without the active and enthusiastic participation of the local government, I, uh, I think is an open question. Uh, what, you two have already had a question. We have a gentleman behind you. Uh, what reason would you give uh, the Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, to cease their actions now that they're becoming more aggressive than ever by us ceasing our bombing, pulling back <coughs> uh, cities and coastal enclaves, and in fact pulling out of the farmlands and giving it back to the VC where they can win back the port of the people and win back the land that they so desperately need to keep their food supply. Let me just paraphrase that. If I may paraphrase that, uh, why uh, would, what would it benefit us to go back to coastal uh, towns and enclaves and give the uh, Viet Cong a chance to uh, win back the support of the countryside? Uh, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think your question may have been a little different than that. You're, you were asking me why, from the standpoint of the Viet Cong in Hanoi, it would be to their interest to uh, negotiate under those conditions when they might be able to achieve on the battlefield uh, all of their objectives uh, without negotiation. Am I, am I correctly uh, stating it? Yes. I think, that, uh, I think that's a crucial uh, question and there's no one that I know of that has any sure answer to it because the uh, government in Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh's uh, government and his supporters uh, in the South uh, have good reason to be somewhat skeptical of a negotiated uh, settlement when you consider what happened last time. Now, they controlled uh, three-fourths of all of Vietnam at, at the time of Dien Ben Phu in 1954. They had almost as much land south of the 17th parallel as they had north of the 17th parallel. We're told that they withdrew behind the ceasefire line the, uh, what was supposed to be a temporary military line at the 17th parallel for two reasons. Number one, because they were under great pressure from the Russians and the Chinese to do so rather than, in, than risk involving the United States in that war. And you'll recall that we had uh, considerable uh, discussion in this country in the spring and summer of 1954 about doing that very thing of intervening militarily. And they wanted to head off that.
The second reason why I think they agreed to negotiate last time and agreed to accept the Geneva uh, Accords and the armistice was that they were promised elections in 1956, two years hence, which they thought they would win. In other words, they thought they could win uh, at the ballot box the same objectives that they could achieve by continuing the war uh, indefinitely. Now, I, uh, I think that their skepticism in view of the fact that those elections were never held has been a very real factor in their present uh, rejection of a negotiated uh, settlement. I can only say that in 1962, 1963, we did have feelers, very definite uh, peace feelers from uh, the other side, indicating that they might consider a negotiated settlement. There's some reason to think uh, that this is not uh, entirely impossible even today. Uh, my own view is that while uh, there's no immediate uh, prospect through a, for a breakthrough on the diplomatic front that you will encourage uh, the government in Hanoi and encourage the Russians to bring pressure on that government more in a situation where you don't have uh, North Vietnam being pounded from the air. Uh, I think that's the, the only hope for creating a climate where negotiations are possible. But I fully recognize that there's going to be a considerable amount of skepticism on the other side and no surefire uh, guarantee that, that no matter what we do, that negotiations are ahead. It may be a long time to come before we get a breakthrough. Isn't it a fact that the Red Chinese are behind Hanoi and uh, there is no reason to believe that with their support that they should... Uh, even want to uh, negotiate at all if they took over the rest of uh, South Vietnam except for your Formosa and Thai Bai. Uh, isn't it a fact that the Red Chinese are in fact behind Hanoi and uh, well, have no reason to negotiate? Yes, I think it's, uh, it's a fact that they're uh, behind them, but as I said here earlier, they're, they're a long ways behind as far as uh, committing their own uh, troops and their own manpower uh, to that war. And furthermore, I think the fact that Red China uh, shares a, a common frontier with North Vietnam is a matter of some anxiety even for the communist Ho Chi Minh government. As I indicated just briefly in my remarks uh, this afternoon and again uh, uh, tonight, I think it, it does not necessarily follow that Ho Chi Minh wants to be a puppet of the Red Chinese. And the one thing that is uh, opening up the possibility of a Chinese uh, occupation is the continuance of this war. I think that uh, it's quite possible that that may be one factor that would cause Hanoi to come to the conference table and try to end the war rather than encouraging them to continue. <clears throat> Gentleman in the suit. This is a, a war that's being fought just in the south, and we're considering negotiations with the North. How sure are we that you being articulated by the North Vietnamese are uh, those that the South Vietnamese are uh, Yeah, I'll just repeat it. Mm -hmm. that, this is a very good question. The question was uh, if the war is being fought in the South, uh, how can we be sure? that when we negotiate with the North, we're actually negotiating with a government that can speak to the forces uh, fighting in the South. Uh, my answer to that is that any negotiations that are worth the uh, paper they're written on are going to have to include uh, spokesmen who can speak uh, for the National Liberation Front in the South. Now, the President and Secretary Rusk have both said that we would have no objection to North Vietnam, including in any delegation that they bring to the conference table, uh, responsible representatives of the National Liberation Front uh, in the South. I, uh, I think that, that would have to be done. I think you'd have to have the uh, leadership of the uh, uh, Viet Cong forces in the South present at any uh, uh, negotiations, and this has to be uh, something that we're willing to concede uh, if those negotiations are to mean anything. Uh, 
There might be uh, there might be some difference of opinion on uh, some points between the uh, National Liberation Front in the South and the uh, government in Hanoi, uh, but in general, I think they uh, are very close. I think we have considerable evidence uh, that Hanoi is exerting uh, leadership on the uh, war in the South, and while the main thrust of that war continues to be uh, carried by the uh, South uh, Vietnamese, the Viet Cong guerrillas in the South, I think there is a close working liaison between Hanoi and the National Liberation Front so that there would not be any major uh, differences between the two. I think where you might have a, a difference of opinion and probably do have a difference of opinion is between Peking on the one hand and uh, Hanoi and the National Liberation Front on the other. Because looking at it from the standpoint of China, they may very well think it's in their interest to keep this war going as long as possible. This serves their argument that the United States has picked up the mantle of Western uh, uh, interference and Western imperialism in Southeast Asia, however unfair that charge may seem to us. It uh, prevents the uh, North Vietnamese communists from developing a, an independent position with reference to China because the war forces Hanoi to depend somewhat on, on China for aid and support. So I think the, the real difference is more apt to be between Peking uh, and the other forces than it is to be between the Hanoi and the National Liberation Front. Gentlemen, the fact. <laughs> well, what does the administration define as victory in South Vietnam, and what about democratic regime? Well, the, uh, the administration uh, position has changed uh, somewhat on that uh, point. When the uh, president made his speech in Baltimore on uh, November or on uh, April 7th, he laid down uh, two stipulations that he has since withdrawn. Uh, number one, he made it clear that we would not uh, negotiate uh, with uh, representatives of the National Liberation Front, and he has since modified that position. Uh, number two, he said that any settlement would have to envision an independent South Vietnam. Now that position has also been changed and the president has made it clear that our position now is that we would permit the people of South Vietnam to decide whether they wanted to remain independent or to unite with the North, which was the alternative that was opened up to them in the Geneva Accords of uh, 1954. Now I think your question as to what the administration would settle for uh, at the conference table uh, is a very difficult one uh, to answer. Perhaps it could be better directed to the State Department official who's going to be here uh, tomorrow night. But I think even he uh, would doubtless say that we would not go to the conference table with an ironclad uh, set of uh, uh, points that we would insist on, but rather we would enter into negotiation without uh, an entirely uh, rigid position. It's my own feeling that as a bare minimum, we would have to have some kind of formula to provide for the safety and the security of the people that have been fighting on our side uh, in this conflict. There would have to be some kind of peacekeeping force, either a UN force or, or an all-Asiatic force, or perhaps even the continuance of some American uh, troops in South Vietnam under, uh, under uh, international uh, auspices to make certain that reprisals were not carried out against the uh, people who have been identified uh, with us. I think we have some obligation to protect the lives of the, the religious groups and the, the pro-government uh, people that have been fighting uh, on our side uh, these past uh, six or seven years. I would hope that if we get into another Geneva-type settlement, 
that we would add one ingredient this time that we didn't have in 1954, and that's a, a peacekeeping uh, force strong enough to see that the agreement is, is carried out. Sir? <laughs> well, this is a this is a good question. I I think that uh, uh, the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee was quite correct last Sunday when he said that there has been a growth of uh, Pentagon influence on foreign policy uh, in the years since uh, World War II. Uh, any any reading of uh, developments associated with the Vietnam War uh, leaves no doubt that Secretary McNamara has been a very powerful and decisive influence in the conduct of that uh, effort in Vietnam. Sometimes it seems that our diplomatic policy follows the military rather than the other way around. It's always seemed to me that in an undeclared war of that kind where everybody recognizes that the politics is, uh, is exceedingly important, and diplomacy is important, and the, the psychological uh, attitudes are important, that the State Department ought to be on top, speaking, of course, to the president and acting with his uh, authority, and that the military ought to play a subordinate, an entirely secondary role in which their function is largely to carry out the goals of, of diplomacy and, and the political factors. But I'm not sure that it's always operated that way. I think in some cases the momentum of the military effort has tended to determine uh, what our policy was and what the outcome of our policy uh, would be. And I very frankly am disturbed by the, the growing power, not only of the Pentagon, but the CIA, uh, in determining American foreign policy decisions, uh, decisions that are, are ratified and, and supported by uh, presidential assistance, with the Foreign Service apparently playing a secondary role and the Congress playing almost no role at all. <laughs> Let's have one more question from that gentleman there. As I understand the, uh, the question, uh, it really is posing the uh, domino theory in reverse, that uh, the question being, uh, we, we seem to have alienated uh, Cambodia by our military involvement in Vietnam, and uh, is that, does that pose a danger that we will cause a similar alienation of other Asiatic countries that are disturbed about our military role in Vietnam. Uh, I have uh, believed for a long time that that's a real danger. I think that uh, the, uh, several of the dominoes have fallen uh, because of the growing military involvement of the United States in South Vietnam. Cambodia is the classic example, but Burma is another one. Our relations with Burma have steadily deteriorated during the time that we have increased our military uh, interference uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. Ambassador uh, Reichauer, who is one of our most able uh, ambassadors, uh, has reported recently a growing uneasiness in Japan about American policy uh, in Vietnam. Uh, there are some uh, uh, indications that uh, the difficulties that we've had in uh, Pakistan and India uh, have not uh, been assisted and have probably been damaged by their uh, sensitivity and their uneasiness about our uh, military involvement in Asia. The fact remains that whether we want to face up to it or not, uh, Western 
white military forces are not very welcome in Asia anymore. The, uh, the uh, imperial powers have been driven out, and while we don't like to think of ourselves as an imperial power, and I don't think we are one, I don't think we want colonies uh, in Asia, nevertheless, we put ourselves in the posture of trying to rescue the old regimes, the old uh, order that many people thought was destroyed when France, Britain, and uh, the Dutch were driven out of Asia at the end of World War II. So I think we do run uh, the risk of alienating uh, sensitive Asian nationalists when we play too heavy a military hand uh, in Asiatic affairs. Uh, Senator McGovern has been speaking steadily since noon today, and I think he deserves a little respite at this time. Senator McGovern, with all the hysterical, perhaps histrionic, uh, misinformation flying around these days, it's a pleasure to hear a reasonable and rational man present uh, your, the point of view such as you have done tonight. On behalf of Sacramento City College and the Convocation Committee and this audience, I'm sure we are very thankful. Thank you.